من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أمن القاسم المصطفى محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واللعنة صلى على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon Fatima and her father and her husband and her children. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, I greet you with the Islamic gr greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I'd like to welcome you to this, what should inshallah ta'ala become a very short series very concise and to the point, and one which does not take the duration of time that you might witness from other series. Taking into account the modern world that we live in, the fact that everything's done at such a fast pace, the fact that we all have, as a result, lower concentration spans, I'd like, in this tragic period of Fatamiya, to zero into a few topics which I think, inspired by the period of Fatimiya, are nonetheless very important for all of us to look at, to think about. And indeed it's my hope that some of them may indeed answer some of the very few misconceptions that we all have, or even satisfy some of the questions that we, many of us think deep down Yet unfortunately due to, dare I say, a lack of introspection, dare I say, a, a, hu a lack of humility in some of us, a stubbornness in some of us, is a conversation which hasn't been had for quite some time. And so I'm going to launch into the topic of this first introductory episode with one which dare I say is a difficult one for me and dare I say is one which I have been thinking about quite personally over the past couple of years and that is the topic of the etiquette of discussing the past and whether or not discussions on the past Discussions about very sensitive topics, quite like the historical tragedy of Fatima al Zahra, salam, whether or not such events could be, in discussions about them, classified as hate speech. Now, of course, the word hate speech. It's one that's thrown around very, very liberally. You see that there's certain people who go around just throwing out that word. You're a hate preacher. This is hate speech. And yet the word is rarely, rarely defined. Rarely do we think about the philosophy and the meanings behind words that we utilize in our day-to-day -day lives. And so sometimes we might just throw out a word, mimicking the masses without even realizing what we are saying. A massive example of this is the fact that in discourse pertaining to critiques of the religion of Islam, many of them, in fact the vast majority of them, whether they're attacking Sunnism, whether they're attacking Shiism, whether they're attacking just verses of the Qur'an, whether they're attacking the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, these attacks are, quite frankly, based upon a profound ignorance and based upon 
a desire to find problems when they don't actually exist. For example, the average person I know who has attempted to hold one of these discussions where they say, I'd like to ask you some questions about Islam, and where they start critiquing the Quran, or when they start critiquing the personality of the Prophet Such a person isn't a man who one day picked up the Quran and decided to start looking into the contents and found a few unexplained problems which he wrote down and thereafter came of his position. They're not people that picked up books of seerah and felt to themselves, let me look inside this book of seerah and found a problematic passage and came to this position. Rather, there are people who, due to a void in their life, a vacuum, decided to jump onto a bandwagon where they could feel good about themselves through attacking the religion of Islam by doing what? Not going back to the original source literature, but rather depending upon Google search type search engines which gather all the information for you conveniently and they came forward and utilized this information. Why do I say this? Because you find them so argumentative. You find that all they want to do is debate. All they want to do is what we call jadal. To enter into disputation. When in reality, neither they are gaining anything, nor is the person who's refuting the misconceptions to them, because such an individual is already approaching the subject with such a jaundiced eye that it's impossible to have a frank and open discussion with them. Now, what was that little example about? Why did I give the example of the Islamophobe who acts in this way? Be they someone who wear a suit, be they someone who wear a track suit, be they someone who wear a football strip, or be they someone who wears a turban and has a long beard. These Islamophobes who attack the religion need to be understood for what they are. Namely, people who are Individuals of hate, individuals who want to find problems where they did not exist, individuals who wish to cast, demonize, and tarnish an entire population within the Western world, not realizing that it makes problems for such a population and that there might be a violent backlash, as often there is in an era of increases in acid attacks and what have you. Now, it's fair to call them hate preachers or hate mongerers. But one thing that we as Muslims have started to use against such individuals often is the term racist. And that's where I take objection. Yes, some of the individuals in fact, many of the individuals who jump onto the bandwagon of the alt-right, of the alt-light and the Islamophobic movements are indeed bona fide, card-carrying, private club members and racists. When I say private club members, I don't mean to say that they're actually a member of some kind of racist club. That's just an expression to mean that, yes, these people in the past were open racists, open bigots. And in fact, many of them have supported things like fascism in the past. But nonetheless, when we give that title, when we say that such a person is a racist, we are essentially playing into a game where what we're doing is we might be calling out a minority in these movements for what they are. But by utilizing the term racist against every individual who comes forward and critiques Islam fairly or unfairly, we're doing a disservice to ourselves. Why? Because they come forward and they say, look, 
I've got nothing against Arabs. I've got nothing against Pakistanis. I've got nothing against Bengalis. I've got nothing against Indonesians. I'm against Islam. And they might even come forward and bring these so-called apostates that they have with them. They might bring to you a Pakistani who's a Christian. They might bring to you a Pakistani who's a Sikh. They might bring to you an Indonesian who's an atheist. And they'll say, look, they're of the same race and I don't have a problem with them. I've got a problem with Islam. And then what happens is people who see your response of calling them a racist would say, he's just saying that because he can't take criticism of Islam. And so what happens is, whilst the person was a hate preacher, because you gave him a wrong and incorrect title, because you labelled people jumping onto a bandwagon, oh, you're racist, you said something false. In today's world, there's many people who use terms without realising what they mean. Likewise, when we say that people are hate preachers, because they discuss the past, we're being extremely, extremely ignorant. We're being extremely, extremely simplistic. And what we're not doing is looking at something which is a very careful nuance in what the intention of a person looking at certain things is. So for example, when a Christian missionary comes forward and chooses to do a whole series on the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and chooses to start speaking about things within Islam which are not even things that they would condemn if they were in their own religion this is hate mongering why? because instead of preaching his own religion namely Christianity instead of looking at what the Christian texts actually say, instead of looking at the moral teachings of the Bible and trying to encourage people to be better people, he's wasting his time attacking someone else and specifically attacking someone for something which Christianity doesn't mandate them to do. This would be an example of hate preaching. But when it comes to the individual who sincerely comes out from the Christians and says, look, I'm a Christian. I'm committed to the Bible. I'm committed to the Gospel. I'm committed to the New Testament. And he says, because I'm committed to the New Testament, I believe in certain values. And one of those values would be, for example, gender equality. Now, that's not to say that the New Testament actually does contain gender equality. That's not to say that the New Testament does actually contain everything that the Christians claim that it does. But let's go with that example for the sake of argument right now. And if such a person would very after say to you, I have a problem with certain areas of the behavior of your prophets that I have read about. They don't sit comfortably with me and I'd like you to explain them. We wouldn't accuse such a person of hate preaching. We wouldn't even accuse them of hate preaching if they went on TV and were to have said the same thing. Why? Because it's not their intention to be hateful. Rather, they're merely looking at actual problems they've identified. So, where does that bring us tonight? In discussing the tragedy that occurred and befell upon Lady Fatima. The tragedy that we as Shia, Ifna Asharia, believe in, and the tragedy which we find recorded in the books of history. What would be the necessary way for us to go around this issue? Well, to be quite honest with you, this is a central element of Islamic history, which has been espoused and taught by our school of thought, by the historians, for over a millennia. 
it's not something just can be swept under the carpet, nor is it something that we are willing to stop speaking about, because this is part of our heritage, this is part of our tradition, and this is part of our narrative. We found it vindicated by the historians. So I know that whilst when some Sunnis hear that, their blood might be boiling. They might be thinking, how dare you say these things? Why is it that you think you can just attack our sacred figures like that? The honest truth to the matter is, you have to stop looking at things from such an eye-centric perspective. You have to understand that in the same way you would want the Shi'i to try and look at things from your perspective, to try and show some adab in the way he's discussing history, we need you to also show some adab when it comes to understanding that the Shi'i isn't convinced by your narrative. The Shi'i isn't born into a Sunni narrative and chooses to go against it. He is not saying something to incite you. He is not deliberately trying to revile certain figures in order to upset you. Do you think that this is done consciously by the Shi'i individual because he wants to upset you? Do you think this is done because the Shi'i wants to deliberately oppose an individual who he believes is righteous? I need you to understand, my dear brother and my dear sister, watching this from the Sunni perspective, that listen, when it comes to discussions of history, people were free to investigate history as it is. And if they reach a certain conclusion, they're merely following what they genuinely believe to be the truth. I, for example, am convinced by this historical narrative because, number one, it's very well attested. Number two, the pillars of my school of thought, who I believe believe in a vindicated worldview, have believed in this. They've narrated it. And number three, because the circumstances surrounding the death of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam are extremely dubious, and I find this account makes the best explanation of the available data. Given that fact, it's extremely difficult to see how I could be considered hate preaching for merely discussing an account which I believe to be true. I find it difficult to consider how this could be thought of as hate preaching because I disagree with your reading of history. It's akin to saying that certain historiographers certain historians who were academics should be considered hate preachers. Now, this is something which really I want the viewer to think about very sincerely and very strongly. Moving on to the second point, which I think is far more fruitful. And this I address now to the Shi'i believing audience that I have in front of me. The Shi'i believing audience who are watching Imam Hussein TV. The Shi'i believing audience who regularly might happen to watch any shows that I do. And the Shi'i believing audience who are interested in areas of disagreement and in areas of dispute and debate between different Muslim sects. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to all approach this from an angle of sincerity. 
my brother, my sister, dear viewer, I would like for us all to consider something which is of the utmost importance to discover, to consider when looking at such an important discussion. And it's with a heavy heart that I say this because it's very difficult to acknowledge your own mistakes in the past. Some of us, when we were still a lot younger, some of us in the past, we have been reactionary and we have forgotten that human side of what it is to be a Muslim and what it is to be a human being. Namely, someone whom others are protected from your tongue. Deep down, I know and I'm sure many of you know as well, there has been this level of arrogance that has been displayed by us in the way we've discussed this. A level of arrogance, ignorance, and dare I say, a complete lack of consideration for two things. Number one, a lack of consideration for how our co-religionists who live in parts of the Middle East, who live in parts of Pakistan, have had to survive throughout the following centuries. We treat these discussions as if it's just inciting the other side. Some of us treat it as a comparison of who's got the bigger tool, who can insult the most. Seriously, some of us, we lacked humanity before. That's the first consideration. The second consideration, are those human beings who happen to be born outside of Shi'i families? those human beings who happen to be born following a narrative which they've been spoon-fed and are sincerely following that narrative to the best of their ability but are not aware of the underpinnings and reality of that narrative. When you approach such a person with this level of arrogance, with this audacity to be rude, to have sly digs, then do you think you're going to be responsible for guiding such a person? Do you think that it's contributing to an academic discussion where you might actually get that person's eyes to open up? We might claim that this is freedom of speech. We might claim that I'm just being academic and objective. But deep down, deep, deep down, many of us who are involved in the field of addressing Shobahat against Shiism, we know that there is this undercurrent of people who are rude, vile, and filthy when it comes to speaking to the opposing side. Allah Azza wa Jal when he tells us to call people to Islam, what does he first say? He says, call to the path of your Lord with hikmah and afterwards with good exhortations. Not only are we told to do it with good exhortations, which is of course contrary to the method which I've just mentioned right now, but we're also told to do it with hikmah, with wisdom. Now, I know that there's certain rawayat which people try to utilize to do taqeed, to restrict the word hikmah and what it means. But my brothers and my sisters, my Shia brothers and sisters, honestly speaking, in which world 
can insulting in such a revile manner, in openly provoking the opposite side in these discussions, be considered hikmah. If you have a burning love for Zahra in your hearts, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her, then you'll try to follow her teachings. And yes, when you distance yourself from her enemies, you would try to distance yourself from their actions. What you wouldn't do, due to this burning, enraged love, is merely go around typing on the internet like some keyboard warrior, vile swear words at her killers. Even if you despised her killers, then you would treat this in the same way you would treat any other issue of seriousness. You don't see your friends. If any of you know someone who has ever had a relative killed in war, for example, or if you've ever known someone who's had a friend or relative who's been murdered, you don't see that person dropping to a level of immaturity and using the name of a murderer or killer or faction which has done the killing and reduce it to cheap, pathetic insults. This is not hikmah. And this is where things could actually be considered hate preaching and being provocative. Dear viewers, when it comes to looking at history, when it comes to the etiquette of looking at history, we need to provide some important, very important guidelines. What are those guidelines? Number one, the first guideline is to be sincere and to ask your Lord for guidance. Number two, the second guideline is to be as objective as possible in looking at the source methodology and to ensure that you're not depending upon an account of history which is completely isolated and is very improbable, very unlikely by even the standards of most historians today. And after that, we need to ensure that when we are looking at history, we are looking at history and we're not looking at theology. These are the important factors when it comes to analyzing history. That's why when some people come forward and they excommunicate others for merely questioning the incident of the door, they are acting in a way which is unbefitting of a Shia. These are not discussions where we're to excommunicate anyone. These are not discussions where we are to use certain facts of history that we are convinced by, certain disasters in history that we are convinced by, in order to insult, in order to provoke people who do not believe in these narratives. Show some respect. Try your best to show some empathy. And try your best to think to yourself, how would I act if I were on the other side of the fence. Remember that not everybody has been blessed to be born into a family which follows the true narrative which you believe you're upon. There are those who remain in the darkness and are searching for the light. And unfortunately today, we have a bunch of children and may Allah guide us all for indeed I may very well have been one of them and certain statements in the past which I've made. It's only now that we're learning to be human from the Ahlul Bayt. We need to the best of our ability to stay away from insults, to stay away from pettiness, but most of all to stay away from arrogance. And if in doing so, we can avoid the hate preaching, then any area of history is open for discussion.
I suggest that those who believe that this is merely something in the past, something we don't need to look at, something that Allah will judge the people that did it, remember my dear brother and remember my dear sister, that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed the Holy Quran. It is not a book which only discusses incidents in the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at a time in which the book was being revealed. Rather, the Kalam of Allah, the blessed word of Allah, the Holy Quran, is a book which discusses the previous nations and what the previous nations brought about, why the tr previous nations fell and why certain civilizations were destroyed. It is only through understanding these things that we can direct ourselves in the best of ways towards a better future. I believe that we've reached the end of the duration of this episode. And so in the next episode, I'll continue with a different topic inspired by this period of Fatimiyyah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.